You probably recognize these ice cream pellets as the ice cream of the future. They're Dippin' Dots, a summertime staple. But this confectionery treat didn't start as, well, ice cream. It started as cow feed. Dippin' Dots were invented in the 80s, not by an ice cream brand, but by a microbiologist. Curtis Jones specialized in cryogenics. In 1987, he was working for a biotech company in Kentucky, trying to figure out how to make food for farm animals more efficient. His big breakthrough came when he flash froze cattle feed 350 degrees below zero, which produced small pellets. Serendipitously, Curtis loved making ice cream. Mm. Next thing he knew, he was using liquid nitrogen to freeze ice cream at extremely low temperatures and ended up with small beads of it. When eaten, the natural heat of the mouth melted the beads and thus, Dippin' Dots was born. A year later, he formed the company out of his parents' garage in Illinois. But there was a problem. Curtis had nowhere to sell the product. Dippin' Dots need to be stored at such a cold temperature that it made it impossible for grocery stores to house the tasty treat. So he got creative and marketed his product to alternate locations. Now they're sold at amusement parks, festivals, zoos, and other summertime destinations. But whether or not they really are the ice cream of the future, we'll just have to wait and see. Ketchup. So American, it's basically the red in red, white, and blue, right? And that red clearly is from the tomatoes the ketchup is made from. Yeah. But that wasn't always the case. The first recorded recipe for ketchup comes from China. And for more than a thousand years, it wasn't even made with tomatoes. It was made with fish guts. Fish intestines, bladder, and stomach all mixed together with salt, then sealed and heated in the hot summer sun for 20 days. That was the original ketchup, a fermented fish paste that dates back to 6th century China. It was popular throughout Southeast Asia, and British and Dutch settlers who arrived in the 1600s loved the stuff. Over time, they brought ketchup home to Europe and added their own modifications, including beer, mushrooms, walnuts, oysters, strawberries, and peaches. By the mid-1700s, English ketchup was a mainstay on British dinner tables, and as colonists went west, it soon made its way across the pond. That's where tomatoes come in. They're native to the Americas, and it's rumored Europeans once believed they were poisonous, but poisonous they were not. In 1812, a Philadelphia horticulturalist and scientist by the name of James Meese introduced tomatoes into the mix. He published a tomato ketchup recipe that was the beginning of a new crimson era. From there, many different iterations were concocted, and by the end of the 18th century, the New York Tribune called tomato ketchup America's national condiment that was on every table in the land. Which brings us back to this. Tomato ketchup is here to stay. And I, for one, don't miss the fish guts. Graham crackers, often best when paired with melted marshmallows and chocolate. But it didn't start out as a sugary snack. Originally, they tasted like cardboard and they were intended to curb your sex drive. It all started with Sylvester Graham, a 19th century minister who believed that alcohol, meat, and fatty foods led to greed, lust, and sexual urges. And well, that had to be stopped. Graham's cure was simple. He preached that bland foods would curb sexual appetite. And he developed a cracker made of unbleached flour, wheat germ, bran, and definitely no sugar. Voila, the graham cracker was born. Graham's theory and his crackers gained a cult-like following. His loyal devotees called themselves Grahamites. 
But as time wore on, Graham's theories tipped the scale of extremism and eventually he lost his popularity. He died in 1851 and that's when the Graham Cracker began to change. Over time, it went through many modifications until the National Biscuit Company, now known as Nabisco, came around and successfully sweetened the bland cracker with some honey, and sometimes cinnamon, and chocolate. However you choose to eat your graham cracker, don't leave out the marshmallow. Fondue. It's this thing we do with cheese. We melt it, we dip it, we eat it. Mm. In the 70s, it became super popular, but that didn't just happen by chance. There was an ominous force behind it, a real life cheese cartel. 100 years ago, cheese was a hot commodity in Switzerland. It was exported at high volumes and played a major role in the Swiss economy. But that all changed after World War I. European countries devastated by the war could no longer afford to buy expensive imported cheese, which was bad news for Switzerland. So the government stepped in and they formed the Cheese Union. Basically, it was a cartel, and it worked like this. The first thing they did was force every dairy farmer and cheesemonger to fix the price of cheese, eliminating competition, meaning everyone could stay in the game. The cheese cartel also told them exactly how much cheese to make and limited the varieties. So instead of making thousands of different kinds of cheese, they only made seven. And it worked! The cartel controlled the cheese supply for decades. By the 70s, they got greedy and wanted to expand their cheese racket globally. So they introduced the world to a dish already popular in the freezing cold Alps, fondue. Mm. By marketing cheese for fondue, the cartel was able to sell more. I mean, think about it. It takes a lot, and I mean a lot of cheese to fill a pot. But as with most cartels, things got shady. Money went missing, people went to jail, and by the 1990s, the Swiss Cheese Union was dismantled. So there you have it. The reason we know and love fondue is because of a shady government program that convinced the world to consume massive amounts of melted cheese. The very thought of Thanksgiving drums up foods worth salivating over, like stuffing, mashed potatoes, and of course, the taupe furkey. But this Thanksgiving veggie substitute wasn't just whipped up overnight, it actually took years of trial and error. So we called the guy who invented it. I am Seth Tibbet, and I am the inventor of Tofurkey. Seth Tibbet was living in Oregon. He was a teacher and a self-professed hippie who lived somewhere, shall we say, unusual. I built my own three-story treehouse out of scavenged wood. He was also a serious vegetarian, so serious that he started his very own tempeh-making company. And I made soy tempeh, five-grain tempeh, and a sausage tempeh called temperoni. And I just made tempeh for the first 15 years. But there was a problem. Which was finding something to eat at my own Thanksgiving. You see, at the time, there were no main dishes for vegetarians available. So Seth set out to solve the problem, and it wasn't so easy. First, he created a stuffed pumpkin. Uh, the stuffed pumpkin was the famous one that we still talk about. The whole thing on the pumpkin was that it collapsed in the oven and it seemed more like a side dish than a main dish. Then there was? The gluten roast, which was really an all day thing, took like eight hours, literally it was just too tough to cut with any kind of implement that we had other than a chainsaw, which we did not bring to the table. Eventually, Seth teamed up with his friend Hans. He was making these tofu uh, roasts, had a little bit of gravy in there with them. We added the drumettes because we were mimicking the turkey and marketed it under the name Tofurkey. Throughout the years, the recipe evolved. We soon realized that this is a vegan feast and vegan plants don't have legs, so yeah, it's been a long journey. Long, strange tempeh trip, as a hippie would say. And now? Around here, we call turkey a tofurkey substitute. 